Maar wat dan als je je minder voelt dan de anderen? De miljoenen mensen die met een depressie kampen, hebben weinig behoefte aan gezelschap. Zij hebben maar weinig opbeurende gedachten. It's something that you have to accept that you're going to have to fight every day. When I'm really, really depressed, sometimes I clean frantically because if I don't keep moving, I feel as though I'll never move again. There are many things I do, but as you spiral down, the worse it gets, the less effective these things are. Hi, Virginia. I'm Helen Mayberg. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me about our study. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get a handle on what areas of the brain basically control the sad experience that's such a major part of everyone's depression. I need you to be willing to let me make you sad and for you to let me to take a picture of it while it's happening. Virginia schrijft haar meest sombere gedachten op om ze later nog eens voor de geest te kunnen halen. Op deze manier willen wetenschappers uitzoeken waarom tijdens een depressie het evenwicht tussen denken en voelen zo makkelijk uit balans raakt. Depression for me started when I was 15, but I didn't realize it was depression. Nobody talked about mental illness in, in those days. And um, I just thought I was a lousy person. I didn't think I had an illness. Um, and it got substantially worse through my 20s. And I wasn't diagnosed till I was 27. Waarom wil Virginia niet meer leven tijdens haar meest sombere momenten? En wat gebeurt er met haar hoop en haar reden? Als droefheid het overneemt. You you have you have no motivation. You can't enjoy anything. It's as if the chemistry that uh, normally allows you to enjoy things is turned off, and there's no point to anything. And it feels as though you're enclosed in something. You're going. To, you're trapped. It's a horrible feeling. It's like I feel like it's be, like being encased in concrete. Op dergelijke scans krijgen wetenschappers voor het eerst de menselijke hersenen in volle actie te zien. Zo krijgen ze meer inzicht in hoe we emotionele ervaringen verwerken en wat de hersenen precies doen bij geestesziekten. By definition, we believe strongly that depression is an illness of the brain, no different from Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease or multiple sclerosis. And in fact, it's probably less your fault than heart disease. What we're going to do, Virginia, now is we're about ready to start with the mood experiment. I'm going to bring the monitor down so that you can read your script, which I've got typed on the monitor, just like what you did. You tell me if it's easy enough to see. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Remember, what I want you to do is to use the script to recreate the image in your mind of being extremely sad. The goal is to be as sad as possible, not to fight it, just let yourself go. Kevin's in the control room monitoring the cyclotron, and at the proper time, he'll give you the injection of the radioactive water and we'll take the picture of your sad brain. I'm gonna turn the screen off. I want you to lie there and just don't fight that sad mood. The scan will start in about 20 seconds. Virginia zakt weg in droefheid en tegelijk laat de scan een opmerkelijke transformatie in haar hersenen zien. Voor Virginia heeft het leven op dit ogenblik geen enkele betekenis of geen enkel doel meer. De activiteit van haar frontale hersenkwabben dooft volledig uit. Wat we zien is dat als iemand intense intense sadness, een combinatie van dingen gebeurt. There are areas of the brain that become highly activated, 
that we can measure by a marked increase in brain blood flow. And at the same time, there are other areas of the brain that become inactive or deactivated. And it's this balance between increased activity in what turn out to be some of the oldest and deepest structures in the brain in the limbic system, the emotional centers of the brain, we think, and turning off of our higher cognitive areas, predominantly in the frontal lobes, we have a change in the balance between old and new parts of the brain. So Virginia, rate your mood for me now. About a six. six okay. Seven. You can go ahead and, and stop. Open up your eyes for me. How are you feeling? Well, bad. Well, I'm really sorry you're feeling bad, but I'm really glad you're feeling bad because that was absolutely perfect. So I want you to kind of relax, think some happy thoughts. Let's talk a little bit about something else. There's something inherently miswired about the brain. Het onderzoek van Helen Mayberg bewijst hoezeer we onze frontale hersenkwabben nodig hebben om ons goed te voelen. When you're sad, you don't think straight in just the same way that a depressed patient can't think straight when they're dysphoric and sad and depressed. The issue is, is healthy people can snap out of it. They can increase their thinking, really suppress the activity of their feeling to work around it. Does that really mean that there's a level of hardwiredness? and that predisposes you maybe never to be depressed or to be to continue to look at things in a negative way. It may be that everyone has their breaking point. Everyone, even without a genetic predisposition, without a family history, will have a life event that is so extreme and so negative that the only reaction possible is a breakdown in the way feeling and thinking are modulated in terms of the behavior so that everybody can, has the capacity for depression. The issue is, is that some people come with a lower threshold to have that um, illness kick in. And I think that the experiments are really one way to try to see what the brain is doing and how healthy people and depressed patients are different. Dergelijk onderzoek kan nieuwe therapieën helpen ontwikkelen. Maar het zet ook vraagtekens bij de relatie tussen onze hersenen en onze geest. Ontstaat ons zelfbewustzijn als een bijproduct van de hersencellen of is het een mysterie van een hogere orde? Donald Stuss heeft daar een controversieel antwoord op. Door zijn onderzoek bij mensen met hersenletsels is hij ervan overtuigd dat onze frontale hersenkwabben de toegangspoort zijn tot het hoogste niveau van bewustzijn. The interesting part is that every brain scientist, as they get older, start to deal more and more with the idea of consciousness in the brain. It's the most important question, because it does define who we are. And because consciousness means we are, the fact that we ask the question indicates that we're self-reflective. You can't ask that unless you are self-reflective. Can one answer that? Probably not in our lifetime, but there are certain things that seem to me absolutely true. That if you have damage to the frontal lobes, that there is a type of consciousness that is impaired that seems to be at the highest level. The Moises in Quebec, and uh, it's actually a fairly... Een van de hoogste niveaus van bewustzijn of zelfbewustzijn lijkt samen te hangen met het kunnen ophalen van herinneringen. Zoals Donald Stuss hier doet met zijn dochter Lianne. To have an awareness of yourself means awareness of yourself 